Good afternoon to those in the Boston time zone and good day to everybody. Welcome to the Monday seminar series presented by the USDA Human Nutrition Resource Center on Aging at Tufts University. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jose Ordovas and I serve on the HNRC seminar uh, committee. I have the honor of moderating today's lecture. Today, we are inaugurating the, this fall semester that includes a distinguished roster of 11 speakers. Uh, each an expert in disciplines uh, that intersect food, nutrition, and aging process. Our speakers originate from all over the world and will share their seminal uh, research with us. Today, uh, we are honored to host uh, Dr. Amy Miller, who is not only a recognized academician, but also a devoted and respected mentor and an accomplished researcher with over 100 publications. Uh, she holds the position of associate professor and associate chair in the Department of Epidemiology and Environmental Health at the University of Buffalo. Dr. Millen has been an influential figure in the domain of nutritional epidemiology. Her scholarly trajectory is commendable. Upon learning her PhD in nutritional uh, sciences from the University of Wisconsin at Madison, Dr. Millen rapidly established herself as a remarkable contributor to her field. She initiated her career uh, at the University of Buffalo uh, in, back in 2007 as a postdoctoral fellow and rose through the academic ranks uh, securing her tenure. Uh, today, Dr. Millen will present a lecture on investigations into the gut microbiome and age-related macular uh, degeneration, a topic that is just part of uh, uh, her uh, really broad uh, research interest in nutritional epidemiology. Uh, before we proceed to the main event, I wish to remind all attendees that the uh, question and answer uh, session will follow the lecture. You are encouraged to submit your questions into the designated Q and A box on the lower part of your screen at any moment during the presentation. So now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, it is my distinct pleasure and honor to yield the virtual podium to Dr. Amy Miller. Thank you, Jose, so much for that lovely introduction and for the invitation to speak at your nutrition and aging seminar. Today, I'm going to present some results on a pilot study that we've conducted looking at investigations into the gut microbiome and age-related macular degeneration. So first, I will give an overview of age-related macular degeneration, which I'm going to refer to as AMD. And then I'll talk about the evidence of a role of nutrition in the etiology of AMD. I'll introduce why we think the gut microbiome might play a role in AMD and present some results from our pilot study. And then I'll discuss a little bit with you what I think those results mean and talk about future direction. Let's talk about macular degeneration. Age-related macular degeneration, or AMD, is one of the main causes of visual loss. The prevalence of AMD is 2 million in those older than age 40. If you include earlier stages of the disease, not just those that are vision-threatening, the prevalence increases to 7 million. This slide shows what viewing these little boys would look like if you had with without late-stage AMD. Individuals with AMD experience loss of central vision due to degeneration of the retina's macula. They lose the ability to see fine detail. For example, reading becomes difficult or impossible, and individuals with AMD lose a lot of independence. This slide also shows a cross-section of the eye. The retina, the inner layer of the eye, which contains light-sensitive cells or photoreceptors, is seen here. And the macula is located centrally in the back of the retina near the optic nerve. The center of the macula is referred to as the fovea and contains the largest concentration of photoreceptor cones. Cones are what are needed for central vision, seeing fine detail and resolution, whereas photoreceptor rods are needed for night vision and peripheral vision. 
This slide shows a cross section of the macula where most of the light that enters the eye is concentrated. So light images, as you can see on the right, are projected onto the retina and transmitted to the brain via the optic nerve. Oxidative metabolism and thus oxidative stress is very high in the retina. The rods and cones, which are on the top of the cells seen on the top of this slide, sit in a layer of retinal pigment epithelium cells. And the retinal pigment epithelium, or RPE, nourishes and renews the photoreceptors with lipid-rich membrane. Brooks membrane lies under the retinal pigment epithelium and acts as a blood-brain barrier, and this membrane can thicken with age. Underneath Brooks membrane are choriocapillaries, and these carry nutrients and oxygen to nourish the retinal pigment epithelium and photoreceptors. In the early stages of AMD, which are asymptomatic and are the most common form, you get lipid and mineral rich deposits that accumulate between Brooks membrane and the blood, sign, um, blood supply. And these are termed drusen, which I've outlined in orange on this slide. You also get a clumping of melanin granules, signaling distress of the RPE cells. And this drusen compromises the flow of nutrients and oxygen to the retinal pigment epithelium. And you get a, a distress in the retinal pigment epithelium. The body often identifies the drusen as foreign, and this leads to an inflammatory response, with the end result being photoreceptor atrophy and death. About a quarter of people over 65 have substantial drusen. In the late stage of the disease, seen on the far right, you get compromised oxygen delivery, delivery likely due to the drusen buildup, and this can lead to neovascularization, exudation, resulting in vision loss and scarring. Here's a cartoon of retinal fundus photographs looking straight at the back of the eye. The dark spot seen here is the macula, and you can see the optic nerve to the right of the macula. The presence and stage of AMD can be determined by grading such retinal photos. Generally, early AMD, as seen on the top, is defined by the presence of small drusen of specified size, as well as pigmentary abnormalities, either a hyper or hypopigmentation in the retina. Intermediate AMD is similar to early, but with more with larger and more extensive drusen or pigmentary abnormalities. And late stage advanced AMD is defined by the growth of blood vessels from the choroid blood supply into the retina, or defined by the death of photoreceptors in the macula, depending on whether you have a wet or dry form of late stage disease. We now know that inflammation is involved in the pathogenesis of AMD, and epidemiologic studies have shown that persons with a history of inflammatory diseases have a greater odds of AMD, and that systemic markers of inflammation are positively associated with AMD. Inflammatory molecules are found in bruisin, suggesting the existence of a chronic, a local chronic inflammation in the retina. It's also known that genetic variants of inflammatory response proteins are associated with increased risk of AMD, such as single, poly single nucleotide polymorphism and complement factor H. So what do we know about a role of nutrition in AMD? Because of the evidence that oxidative stress and inflammation are likely involved in the pathogenesis of AMD, Two randomized placebo-controlled clinical trials of high-dose antioxidant supplements called the Age-Related Eye Disease Study, or ARIDS, one and two were conducted. The first ARIDS was conducted in from 92 to 2001, and the second from 2006 to 2013. And these clinical trials showed that supplementation with high-dose antioxidants reduced the progression of AMD from early to late disease by 25%, over five years. On the right of this slide, you can see a list of observational studies. Um, it's not totally inclusive, but a number of the major observational studies are, are illustrated here. And these have provided evidence that healthy diet patterns protect against AMD, with the strongest evidence being for prospective study design, which looked at uh, reduction and progression from intermediate to late stage disease. 
So this slide shows a cross-sectional um, cross analysis that we conducted in the carotenoids and age-related eye disease study, or CARES. This is the cohort in which um, we conducted our pilot data that I will be showing you uh, our results of during this talk. In this table, what you're seeing are associations between women's or participants' adherence to either the healthy eating index or a Mediterranean diet pattern and the odds of prevalent EMD. So as adherence went from quartile one to five, with five being better adherence for these different diet patterns, you see in the boxed region that the odds of AMD decreased. In another analysis, we looked at the progression of AMD to any on the top left, early bottom left, or late AMD, and participants of the atherosclerosis risk and community study. And we saw an inverse association with progression to any early or late with high compared to low intake of a prudent diet pattern, but positive associations with high compared to low intake of a Western diet or unhealthy diet pattern. And the results were only statistically significant for progression, um, progression to late AMD. Let's talk about the gut microbiome. The body has trillions of microorganisms, including bacteria, fungi, viruses, and their genes, all within your gastrointestinal tract. The colon has 10 to the 13 or 10 to the 14 microorganisms, over a thousand prevalent species, and each individual has approximately 160 species per person. There are many factors we believe to influence an individual's gut microbiome, including what you can see here in this figure, such as whether or not we were delivered vaginally or via C-section, um, infant feeding practices, pharmaceuticals, where you live, lifestyle cho choices, inclusive of diet. Diet is a big factor influencing individuals' gut microbiomes. So now we are proposing that there is an interplay between diet and the gut microbiome that could mediate one's risk for AMD. So why do we think that? Well, nutrients in the diet feed the gut microbiome and thus influence its composition. For example, intake of high fiber diet provide indigestible resist resistant dietary fiber that is metabolized by the gut bacteria in an anaerobic environment of the large intestine. This digestion produces short chain fatty acids, such as acetate, propionate, and butyrate. And these short chain fatty acids help maintain the integrity of the gut lining by ensuring tight cell junction. Gut bacteria can also produce atherosclerotic metabolites. Some bacteria can metabolize choline to produce trimethylamine, which is a precursor to tri methylamine and oxide, or TMAO, which is proatherosclerotic. And furthermore, bacteria can synthesize nutrients such as folate and B vitamins, which may be beneficial to eye health. And last, some preliminary data suggests that bacteria could translocate from the gut to the retina, eliciting a local response from the eye. This slide also illustrates other risk factors for AMD, such as obesity and environmental factors like smoking. Obesity and smoking influence the gut microbiome, and evidence suggests that the gut microbiome influences body weight. So minimal research has focused on the possible role of the gut microbiome in AMD risk. Studies and mouse models of AMD demonstrate that diet may influence systemic inflammation and advanced AMD through interactions with the gut microbiome. In 2017, Anderson and colleagues used a mouse model of neovascular AMD mice that were raised in sterile conditions and either fed a high fat or a chow diet. The animals on the high fat diet developed more neovascular AMD phenotypes. They had more systemic inflammatory markers and less abundance of bacteria known to promote tight cell junctions than the child fed animals. 
the high fat diet animals also had a higher ratio of the phyla firmicutes to bacteria dates. A higher ratio of these of this um, higher ratio of firmicutes to bacteria dates phyla is also seen in obese individuals compared to non-obese individuals, as the firmicutes phyla are thought to be more efficient in obtaining energy from food, thus leaving more energy for the host to consume. When the high fat diet animals were given a microbiotal transplant from the child fed animals, there was less neovascular A and D phenotypes and they had better intestinal gut integrity. Also, when the high fat diet animals were given antibiotics, there was a reduction in their neovascular A and D phenotypes. Another study by Rowan, so Dr. Sheldon Rowan, who's there at Tufts used a mouse model that developed metabolic changes similar to diabetes. And the retina developed phenotypic changes like A and D when, fed, when these animals were fed a high glycemic diet. The gut composition shifted towards a higher proportion of firmicutes to bacteria dates. So this F to B ratio was higher. And when the high glycemic diet animals were switched to a low glycemic diet, they saw a reversal of A and D phenotypes and the FD ratio became less than one. These two animal studies may suggest that influences of the diet on A and D is in part through its influence on the gut. In 2017, a case control study with 12 neovascular A and D cases and 11 controls was conducted on the gut microbiome of A and D. And like the mouse studies, they saw a greater abundance of firmicutes in A and D cases and bacteria babies and controls. Because they used whole genome sequencing, they were able to use databases to match the whole genome sequence of the species to their functions. And they saw upregulation in gene pathways in cases that in the upper the pathways were in cases, and the pathways were involved in L alanine fermentation, glutamate degradation, arginine biosynthesis. And they saw a down regulation of metabolic pathways, such as those involved in fatty acid elongation. And in this study, no cases of intermediate or early AMD were studied. This focused only on advanced cases of AMD. So, this pilot that I'm going to present my research on today was funded by the Bright Focus Foundation to determine the composition and diversity of the microbiome by the prevalence of AMD among participants of the carotenoids and age-related IDC follow-up study, or CARES-2. And we called this um, pilot study the Microbiome and Eye Disease Study, or the MEE study. So CARES is an ancillary study of the Women's Health Initiative observational study and they recruited 3,000 women from three clinic centers in Wisconsin, Oregon, and Iowa. To be eligible for CARES, women had to have baseline dietary carotenoid lutein intakes above the 78th percentile or below the 28th percentile, which included half of the women at these sites. 2005 women were enrolled in CARES between 2001 and 4. There were about 1,800 participants in CARES with fundus photographs or doctor confirmed A and D. And at the follow up study, which was conducted 15 years later, from 2016 to 2019, 685 women participated in CARES. Before this pilot study, we conducted a feasibility study during the recruitment phase of CARES 2 and determined we could remotely collect stool samples from women and that there was not a differential response rate by AMD stage. This helped us get the bright focus funding. When women in CARES 2 came to the, the clinic visit, they had 30 degree stereoscopic fundus digital images taken of their retinas. They also had an opportunity to have ocular coherence tomography scans taken. They were graded, the scans and the photos were graded at the University of Wisconsin Fungus Reading Center using the age-related eye disease study protocol. 
the Beckman clinical classification of AMD was used to grade AMD status. And we women were categorized into an AMD status based on the status of their worst eye. For some women, we obtained confirmation of AMD status from medical records provided by uh, physicians, or we used Medicare claims data to confirm AMD status of a follow-up visit. Our CARED staff sent recruitment letters to participants from, from the Wisconsin site with consent forms. So we sent, um, just to be clear, I know I said that a little confusingly, the CARED staff sent recruitment letters to all women in CARES at all three sites, but the letters were coming from the Wisconsin, Wisconsin site. If a signed consent form was returned, Participants were mailed a stool collection kit to the participant. And if a non-participant form was returned, nothing was mailed to the women. Women who participated in the study had to have not been on antibiotics or undergone a colonoscopy for three months prior to the stool collection. And all the stool samples were mailed to us at the University of Buffalo. There were 609 remaining participants of CARES 2 eligible for recruitment in 2021. Some of the women had passed away or had developed cognitive changes, so they were not included or recruited into the study. 91 women were lost to follow up or did not respond, and 125 declined to participate. We consented 357, of whom 307 returned stool samples of good quality. The stool collection kits that were sent to women consisted of gloves, a stool paper catch for the toilet, a stool nucleic acid collection and preservation tube, and return packaging. And we stored the stool samples at 20 degrees Celsius upon arrival until they were shipped to Norwegian Biotech for sequencing. Participants were also sent questionnaires to ask about their eye and health history about recent medication and supplement use and dietary intake. So this table shows the characteristics by AMD status in the sample. Out of the 307 women who returned samples that were of good quality, we had 300 individuals with AMD outcome data. And AMD status was determined as previously described. We had 132 women with no AMD, 59 who were de um, deemed to have early, 99 with intermediate, and 10 with late AMD. So age and family history were positively correlated with increasing disease status. Although not statistically significant, the late cases had uh, lower BMIs, and their sample was primarily white and highly educated, and the average age of women was 80 years old. We were also able to identify women who had reticular pseudodrusin phenotypes. So what is reticular pseudodrusin? Well, this is a different form of drusen than what I described before. It lies above the retinal pigment epithelium. It's more common in women and those with high genetic risk for AMD. It's a biomarker for subsequent development of geographic atrophy, which makes it very unique. Um, and it also isn't distinguishable from just looking at retinal photos. You need to have ocular coherence tomography scans in order to be able to grade for presence of particular pseudodrusin, which we did. So we were able to identify 32 women who had reticular pseudodrusin present and 195 who did not. Um, a slightly smaller sample um, because not all the women had OCT scans. So this table shows, again, the characteristics by the presence of this outcome. Women are older, women with reticular pseudodrusin are older and have a greater family history of AMD, but there's no big differences in BMI that are seen in human cases and those without disease. 
So we sequenced all 307 unique samples across five plates, um, included 10% duplicates and one blow per plate. Each row contained a positive or negative control from Norgen and a mock DNA sample. Sample were randomized to plates and on plates, and we didn't see differences in characteristics of participants by plates. Norgen Biotech Corporation near Toronto, Ontario, was sent the stool samples and isolated the microbial DNA. So all bacteria contain a 70S ribosome used in protein synthesis. And the small subunit, or the 30S subunit, is comprised of protein plus the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. And the hypervariable region three and four of the bacteria's 16S ribosomal gene were targeted and sequenced using the amino mycin. And these variable regions of DNA are what is used to identify the taxonomy of the bacteria in the sample. So upon receipt of the nucleotide sequences or the raw FASTQ files from Norgen, our team used FASTQ and MultiQ to examine the quality of our DNA sequence reads. The sequence link distribution was examined and assessed for failed extraction or sequencing. We use the data to pipeline to identify Aplincon sequence variants or ASV. We excluded those species whose frequencies were less than 0.005% of the total reads. And the SOLVA database, version 38, matched the ASVs with taxonomy. So it's important to note that the data with respect to the relative abundance of different species or genera in our sample is compositional. Each species is expressed as the relative abundance of a species out of all species detected in a person's sample. So if the relative abundance of one species increases, it, it must therefore decrease for one or more other species or species. Such compositional data can lead to challenges in analyses and sometimes spurious correlations between parts of the composition. So we transformed our relative abundance measure to minimize this possibility using the center log ratio transform transformation denoted CLR. And so all the relative abundance values that I'm going to talk about in this talk are center log ratio transform. So for each participant, we took the relative abundance of each species, divided it by the relative, by excuse me, by the geometric mean of the relative abundance of all species and took the log of that. So when you see these data, these the CLR transformed relative abundance data, values greater than zero indicate relative abundances greater than the average of all samples in that individual. And if a value is less than zero, it means that the relative abundance of that species or genera is less than the average of all species in that individual. This data is, a, is shown here, but we identified three unique kingdoms, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryota. Bacteria comprise 98.5% of our sample. What you can see on this slide is that among the bacteria taxa that were classified, we identified 11 phyla, 180 genera, and we also observed 380 unique species, 156 could be classified and 224 were unclassified. The pie chart shows that among the 11 phyla that we identified, a great, the greatest percentage of um, species is reflected to be part of firmicutes. Bacterial gates have the next highest percentage of species. And, and you can see from the list, um, the list of the phyla by the percentage of species in each group, in each phyla. So in this presentation, I'll be presenting measures from the alpha and beta diversity of our sample. We use two measures for diversity. And the first one is alpha diversity. And this indicates species diversity within one sample. 
in the literature, increased gut diversity or alpha diversity is often associated with better health outcomes. Beta diversity, on the other hand, indicates species diversity between different samples. So this slide here describes how the measures of richness and evenness are used to assess alpha diversity. So let's assume each fruit is equivalent to a species in this example. And in the first pile of fruit on the left, there are only three fruits. So we would say it has low richness and the amount of each fruit is not equal. So there's four apples and one orange and one pear. So we would say it has low evenness. In the next pile, there are three fruit, but now there are two fruit per each type. So although the richness remains low, the evenness has increased. In the last pile, seen here, has both high richness and high evenness. So this slide demonstrates the concept of beta diversity. Here's a um, slide. So you can see samples one and two and samples three and four. Samples one and two only share one species, three and four share four. So there's low beta diversity between samples three and four because it's difficult to differentiate between these samples as compared to one and two. So here's results from our study. This slide shows box plot of the of three alpha diversity measures that we use. And the alpha diversity measures are shown on the y-axis of each figure and AMD status categories on the x-axis. And you, if you move left to right, the first figure shows the measure of species richness, so just count of number of species in the sample. Shannon entropy measure takes into account richness and evenness. And the inverse Simpsons measure takes into account richness and evenness, but weights the species by their relative abundance. So we show results for non-early intermediate geographic atrophy and neovascular AMD. We've separated the geographic atrophy, which is the wet advanced AMD from the neovascular AMD cases. I'm sorry, geographic atrophy is the dry from neovascular AMD, which is the wet advanced cases because the alpha diversity measures really differ between these groups of individuals. Mean differences in alpha diversity across AMD, AMD stage varied significantly for the inverse Simpsons and the Shannon index. I'm sorry, for the inverse Simpsons. But when you look at the Shannon index and the inverse Simpsons, you can see that pairwise comparisons show significant differences between neovascular AMD and intermediate AMD. And the alpha diversity is lower in the neovascular AMD cases. We then examine these alpha diversity measures across A and B stage after adjusting for age and smoking status as confounding variables. So you see means and standard deviations for each alpha diversity measure, richness, channel, and inverse symptoms by A and B stage for crude, age adjusted, and age and smoking adjusted analysis. And the conclusions from the previous slide were made and changed. Neovascular A and D cases have lower alpha diversity than other AMD stages for inverse Simpsons. Now, we also did this analysis for this particular pseudodrusen, and we didn't see any differences in the alpha diversity by presence of particular pseudodrusen. Next, we tested for beta diversity across the different categories of AMD and reticular pseudodrusen. We visualize the association by graphing the samples according to the top two principal components. So the axes are the principal components for age and smoking adjusted terminovas were conducted using the Atchison distance. So you see on the left the results for AMD status, and on the right, for particular pseudodrusen. And the results for beta diversity are not statistically significantly different. This slide shows a compositional plot of the phyla by AMD status, and you can see the most abundant phyla are firmicutes and bacteria babies. We observe no differences in the mean relative abundance of the 11 classified bacterial phyla by AMD status in crude or adjusted models. 
However, I want to note that when we did this analysis and we looked at um, the relative abundance of phyla by A and B status, we removed the three geographic atrophy cases as they differed from the neovascular cases in their alpha diversity. Um, the following analyses that I show you also do not include these three geographic atrophy cases. We also observed no statistically significant differences in the relative abundance of phyla by a particular pseudo reason. All analyses on this, for this slide and for the genre and the species slides that I'm going to show, were, test, were corrected for multiple testing using the Benjamini Hochberg method, and we chose a p value of less than 0.1 as statistically significant. We also examined the F to B ratio by A and D category and by particular food reason. Remember, in the mouse studies of A and D and in the human study by Sizet and Burry, um, this ratio was higher than those of A and D, but we didn't see any difference in the ratio by A and D status or particular pseudo reason. Now we'll move on to genus analysis. So, this is a compositional plot of the genera in our sample by AMD status. We have plotted the most abundant genera plus those bacterial genera that we saw that were significantly different across AMD status. Those are the ones that are plots. So again, comparisons excluded the geographic attribute cases. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit more or show a closer look at these four different um, genera. So these are volcano plots, and this slide is showing the CLR transformed relative abundance of two of the four bacterial genera that we observed to differ by AMD status. So the relative abundance is on the y-axis, and the AMD status is on the x, and NOVAs were adjusted for age and smoking. On the left is the genus Lyra. We see a statistically significant ANOVA P value showing differences in the relative abundance of LADA by AMD status. In pairwise comparisons, right, we saw statistically significant differences between individuals with neovascular AMD and no AMD and neovascular AMD and intermediate AMD. And in all these cases, the relative abundance of, blood, of the Vladia genus is lower in the neovascular AMD cases. On the right is the genus Desulfurspora, and the neovascular AMD cases had a greater relative abundance than participants with intermediate or no AMD. For the genus Apilopecium, Neovascular AMD cases had greater relative abundance than participants with intermediate or no AMD. And on the right, we see the, Prevotella, the genus Prevotella. So this is a little, um, it's not as clear cut as the previous um, plots that I showed you. Although we saw a significant P value for the ANOVA cross stage of Prevotella, and it looks like the neovascular AMD cases have slightly higher relative abundance, but the pairwise comparisons show that there was a statistically significant difference between intermediate AMD and no AMD with a lower relative abundance in the intermediate AMD cases. This slide show, summarizes the results of our analyses looking at the relative abundance of our 380 bacterial species by AMD status. Here you see the 13 species that were found to be more prevalent in neovascular AMD cases for the most part compared to others. So the yellow highlights here, the yellow superscripts indicate when an ANOVA examining the mean relative abundance of the species across A and B status was statistically significant. The blue highlights show um, pairwise comparisons looking at statistically significant differences comparing intermediate AMD to none, 
The green compares neovascular AMD to none. And the pink compares neovascular to intermediate. So the take home message from this slide is that the majority of the differences that we're seeing with these species tend to be between the neovascular AMD cases and either individuals with intermediate and low AMD. Here are the four species that we observe to have lower relative abundance in neovascular AMD compared to other AMD outcomes. The pink highlights represent differences in neovascular disease compared to intermediate, and the green compared neovascular AMD to none. We did not observe statistically significant differences in the relative abundance of the phyla, genera, or species by reticular pseudo-GTTF. So let's discuss some of these results. So in summary, there were some genera and species that were had a relative abundance that was greater in individuals without neovascular AMD. And there were other species and genera that had a greater relative abundance in those with neovascular AMD. Of particular interest to me, at least, was, was the Bladia genus. We saw a lower, so if you remember, we saw a lower relative abundance of the genus Bladia with increasing AMD severity. We also saw lower relative abundance of the species Bladia pieces in an unclassified Bladia species, species in those with neovascular AMD compared to intermediate or no AMD. A recent study by Zhang et al. observed similar um, findings to ours. And in their study, they had 30 advanced AMD cases and 17 controls, and they also saw a lower relative abundance of the Bladia genus in cases versus controls. But we did not replicate their other findings. So the Bladia genus comes as part of the phyla firmicutes and has the following taxonomy. We identified the following species of the genera, genera Bladia in our sample. This genus is anaerobic, RAM positive, and non motile. It ferments indigestible carbohydrates to produce short chain fatty acids. And it's been shown to upregulate intestinal regulatory T cells. It's also shown to be inversely associated with visceral adiposity or obesity in some studies. So perhaps lower bladia genus indicates low fiber intake in participants with neovascular AMD. So this cartoon illustrates that with a low fiber diet, as seen on the left, and limited or reduced short chain fatty acid production, bacteria can leak through the gut, translocate into your bloodstream, causing an increased inflammatory response. Whereas on the right, with a higher high fiber diet, um, this is prevented by production of short chain fatty acids, which help heal the intestinal um, type junction. Our findings with Bladia led us to look at our self reported dietary intake across AMD status using the free frequency questionnaire data collected at the same time as the stool sample. These data, unfortunately, did not um, support our hypothesis that Bladia, that individuals with lower um, relative abundance of Bladia in the neovascular AMD cases had lower fiber intake. In fact, the, the reverse was true. So that was a little confusing. We're gonna have to look more into this. We also observed a greater relative abundance of two species that are well-known oral pathogens. Fusobacterium nucleatum, or F. nucleatum, is a well-described and known periodontal disease pathogen. It's also been found in colorectal tumors of colorectal cancer patients. 
we also observed a greater relative abundance of bifidobacterium dentium. B. dentium is positively associated with dental care. And in a different ancillary study of the Women's Health Initiative, um, we observed greater relative abundance of B. dentium in individuals who consumed um, high glycemic diets and high sucrose intake. This is because B. dentium can ferment sugars in the mouth. Our neovascular AMD cases had greater total sugar intake and higher glycemic loads down here, the bottom two rows. So this actually uh, aligns with what we're observing with respect to um, the gut microbiome and the presence of this particular um, bacteria and consumption of sugar and glycemic load. So we observed a higher prevalence of Angola casella in our sample. This particular genus has been um, observed in mouse, money, mouse studies to be positively associated with obesity and high fat diet. And like I said, it was a greater abundance in those with neovascular AMD. So in summary, our alpha diversity was lower in those with neovascular AMD. But we did not observe differences in between non or early or intermediate AMD with respect to alpha diversity. And we didn't see differences in alpha diversity by particular pseudo groups instead. Or beta diversity across the stays and particular pseudo groups and status was not statistically significantly different, nor was the F to B, F to B ratio. But we did see differences in the relative abundance of certain genera and species by AMD status, but not particular pseudodrusin. And most of the differences were between those with intermediate neovascular AMD. We saw a lower abundance of the Vladia genus, which is those 13 fatty acid producing bacteria in those with neovascular AMD. We saw higher abundance of periodontal disease and caries um, and obesity related species in those with neovascular. So the strength of our study is that we have a large sample of early and intermediate AMD cases. There's no published data looking at the gut microbiome in these earlier stages of AMD. We were able to adjust for confounders of smoking and age. Our samples from a population-based study, the Women's Health Initiative. We had dietary data available to also look at in relation to our microbiome analyses. And we had graded retinal photos and OCT scans that we could use to assess particular pseudodrusins. Of course, our limitations are that this is a cross-section of design and we can't establish temporality. We had a very small number of advanced AMD cases, which was unfortunate because we were seeing interesting things with the neovascular AMD cases. Um, we use 16 srRNA sequencing rather than whole genome sequencing, and of course, our sample is all women. In conclusion, I would say that the alpha diversity of the gut microbiome is lower in those with neovascular compared to those without AMD, but there's no differences in the alpha diversity between non earlier and yeah. And differences in the relative abundance of certain genera and species may vary between those with and without neovascular AMD. And some of these genera and species are related to complex carbohydrate metabolism, obesity, or associated with inflammatory diseases or sugar fermentation in the oral cavity. So with respect to future work, um, prospective studies will be very important to help us establish temporality. Of course, with aging with related diseases, this always takes time. I would suggest we focus on looking at the progression from intermediate to late AMD based on this pilot data, um, conducting whole genome sequencing of the gut microbiome will be important to understand the functions of the gut microbiome based on the genes they code for in relation to AMD progression. And of course, this could be to possible <coughs> biotic supplementation, which if 
is effective could be part of a multifaceted approach for prevention of late stage AMD. And I would like to thank um, the, the Bright Focus Foundation and uh, another grant from, from the University of Buffalo and my collaborators at UB, Wisconsin, Michigan Vet, and Mount Science. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Milan, for that insightful uh, lecture, pun intended, uh, on the role of uh, gut microbiome and AMD. Uh, now we will transition to the question and answer portion of today's event. And uh, I would like to remind everyone that you are encouraged to submit your questions uh, through the designated Q&A box. And now let's begin with the session itself. Uh, Dr. Millen, our first question comes from Joel Mason. If one corrects for overweight and obesity, does the inverse association with healthy eating index stay significant? In other words, is the apparent detrimental effect of a low healthy eaten, eating index entirely explained by obesity and or high fat diet incited inflammation? So you're um, asking about the earlier data looking at dietary patterns of macular degeneration. Not always. So in our study in Karen, when they adjusted for physical activity, it was a tendon index, but not body weight. And, and similarly in the Eric study, um, adjustment for BMI did not seem to explain the diet pattern association. So obviously this gets kind of tricky because BMI is in the pathway between diet and macular degeneration. So when you adjust for it, it's hard to know if you're uh, adjusting away the association or not, but people do adjust for health, I'm sorry, BMI, and it doesn't always explain associations, these, the protective associations we see with the diet patterns. And I may have missed part of that question. Okay. Uh, now from Lisa Merrill, given the chronic inflammation etiology of AMD, did you consider using a dietary inflammation score in lieu of a med of the HEI scores? Um, I can't. So you mean it, when I'm describing the um, the diet pattern score by AMD status? That's a really good suggestion. So yes, I can do that. Mm -hmm. That rather than just HEI. Now let's go back to, to Joel Mason. There is prior work that shows some of the membrane proteins from periodontal associated bacteria are found in atherosclerotic plaques in humans. Since you found an association with these types of bacteria, it may be of interest to look for similar deposition of these bacteria proteins in the AMD lesions. Fine. That's not a question, it's just a suggestion comment. So, no, but um, you can react, obviously. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree. I think it, I wasn't, I was sort of surprised and, and some of my work is with a periodontal disease ancillary study um, in WHI. So I was sort of familiar with those and was surprised to see them showing up. I mean, I guess surprised, maybe not so surprised because you know, these could be individuals who are at increased state of inflammation and they might also have other inflammatory diseases like periodontal disease and you could imagine them swallowing their saliva and it up in their gut. But I agree, I, I, I think it's provocative and interesting and, and um, could be looked at to see if, if they exist in the dream zone. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Justin. Okay, the next uh, question, yes, this is a question, comes from Sheldon. If you consider the bacterial enterotypes, uh, is there evidence that pregotella dominant enterotypes have greater risk for neovascular AMD than bacteroids dominant enterotypes? I found the pregotella results confusing um, because some of the previous work was 
So some of the previous literature, if I can get this straight, because there's a lot going on, but they were seeing higher Prevotella abundance in control. And we saw a greater, um, I believe, abundance of Prevotella in people without AMD compared to intermediate AMD. But then it was slightly higher in the neovascular AMD cases. And when I looked in the literature, I was seeing well, Prevotella is sometimes associated with inflammatory diseases. Um, so I don't really know the answer to that. Um, I think it's a good question, but uh, I found Prevotella results a little confusing in our study. So if you if you take out the neovascular AMD cases, it looks like it could be protected right? or associated. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question? Well, I don't know if Sheldon can express himself, but to me, it looks like you answered yes. Um, okay, now, um, I think towards the end of your talk, you were uh, you were expressing some uh, doubts within the limitations, right? How this will carry into other populations? Do you expect to find something similar? And I'm talking about geographical populations. I am talking about uh, extending to men uh, because your study was exclusively in women. What is your feeling given your experience about how these findings uh, could be uh, extended uh, in a more general fashion? Um, I think, well, I would say, yes, I would expect us to see similar findings and in fact, maybe even more dramatic differences because I would hope that if I have the opportunity to continue this work, I would pick um, patients or participants with a, with a more broad distribution with respect to dietary intake. Um, and. Mm -hmm maybe race or just lifestyle. You know, I'm I in the sample, which was convenient because it was an age-related eye disease study, we recruited the women who'd already been engaged in the study. But we were recruiting 80-year-old women who were highly engaged in a cohort study on eye disease. And so that probably limits the distribution of the sample with respect to diet and um you know, other confounding factors that could like smoking status or other things that, it, it, that has pros and cons, like you're controlling for yeah. by limiting the sample, but then the distribution of dietary intake may not be as broad as you would see maybe in another sample. So I would think that extending this to a more general sample would lead to more, um, differentiation in the gut microbiome between people with and without advancement. Mm -hmm. But that's just the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. I think we only have one minute left and I have another curiosity just to, to uh, conclude the, uh, the session is say, well, uh, we are going in the direction of precision nutrition, precision medicine. Uh, initially, Genomics was playing a major role, but now it's almost kind of being pushed out by the microbiome in terms of uh, the application of that uh, precision nutrition. Uh, what is your what is your message for us in terms of how this has application into uh, the future? Let's call it the future of nutrition, right? Well, I think that if we can better understand. Well, okay, so this is how I sort of look at it. With the arid supplements, I felt like those were effective because they were treating systemic inflammatory states in individuals and reducing their progression from intermediate to late stage AMD. But that was sort of post absorption of food and, and post gut sort of interaction. I think that this microbiome research could help us understand how we can improve the integrity of the gut and maybe at an earlier step 
and the um, process of digesting food reduce inflammation. So instead of just treating a systemic inflammation that maybe the antioxidant supplements were doing, we could give a probiotic to people who are at high risk for progressing to AMD to help improve the integrity of their gut. And in that way, we could hopefully help also reduce some systemic inflammation. So sort of a step earlier than the um, than the antioxidants. So I would like to understand the gut microbiome okay. better for that reason. Yeah. The whole fiber, I guess. Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and I think our time is over. And again, thank you, Amy, for this wonderful uh, lecture, this wonderful opening to the fall semester uh, that you have provided to us. Thank you. That was, that was great. Thank you so much for having me.